Have you cooked anything yet today? No, we're not open till the 11th. Fishing opener. May 11th? Yep. Are you excited? Uh, yes and no. Still got ice on the road, or ice on the lake, rather. Was there a lot of ice fishing done on, on uh, what is that? That was Leech Lake? Yep. A lot of ice. Yeah, there, was, there was quite a bit. We had a lot of, we had some great ice. So it's just starting to, to open up right now. So we still got quite a bit out there. And so we may get clear ice by the 11th. Hopefully that's the call. Hey, if I was going to, I get some walleye out. I got, I had a buddy bring me some fresh Minnesota walleye last week. One of my dog trainers. I wanted, I didn't want to fry it. I didn't want to bread it. I didn't want to batter it. I just wanted to, uh, you know, maybe flash fry it. I don't know what, what do you call the style of cooking chef Mark Lindsay? Um, if I put a little bit of oil in a skillet and I get it hot and then I just, I get my dry rub on the fish and then I put my fish on top of that oil. Is that a flash fry? Yeah. Pan fry or, or, or yeah, you can do a flash fry, but it's, it's more of a pan fry because you're searing it and then you're going to turn it over and, and do it that way. Pan Very fry. Well, yeah. Okay. Or sauteing, but pretty much pan fry. Okay. That's a great point right there. But real quick, before we go about saute, what would you do that walleye in? I got a dry rub on there called the provider flaky rub that you have. I hope that you yep. try that on your walleye, but I put, I see some of my provider rubs behind you. Thank you very much. I see, I see uh drop tine. I see the Brit. I see the swine and I see the fowl behind you. I know my labels, don't I? But um, do you do <laughs> that flat? Do you do that pan fry in olive oil or another oil or butter? What would your preference be? My personal preference, because I like the taste, is butter. That is not my doctor's preference, okay? But that or a little regular oil. I don't use olive oil a lot unless it's the right olive oil. Like some olive oils are made for sauteing and some are made for making dressings. Um, so your preference would be exactly what? What would you put in there to start that pan fry? I would put a little uh, butter myself and maybe just mix it with a little oil because I want the flavor from the butter. The thing is, if you use <coughs> just butter, um, if you use raw butter, it's going to smoke more. So you either have to clarify the butter or add a little oil to it, but don't go super hot. Don't just go, go super longer. <coughs> so if you're, you know, if you're using butter, you're going to do a little lower temperature and you're just going to let it sear longer on the one side. So it gets brown. So with with all of the ability now with with the and I and I know that cooking in fat has been around forever. Um, bacon fat, beef fat, uh, lard. There's even right. like tubs of wagyu lard you could buy now. Um, yep. Would you ever cook fish in in any any type of lard? I know that w would it be weird to cook a white fish like walleye? in a beef lard or a ha or a, a duck fat or okay let's say like that would duck fat do good on fish yeah i would definitely do that it's going to impart some flavor it's the thing about duck fat it's not overly gamey you know what i mean it's just got that hint i uh, also i love bacon fat for that you know what i mean bacon. it's going to add that flavor to it um all those are going to impart some type of flavor on it and not not scary flavor like some nice flavor on it do you save your bacon fat, like personally, when you're cooking at home? Do you have a thing in your freezer of different flavors of lards or different types of lard? Well, I have some duck fat on my shelf that I keep. And then if I'm using good bacon, like if I'm just going to the store and I buy some bacon, probably not. But if I bring some Nooski bacon from work or I get some Nooski bacon fat from work, then I'm keeping that fat. Nooski? Yeah, Nooski. It's from Wisconsin. But we get it through our 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 purveyor, and you can get it from other places. Um, it's got just a, a a different, more impressive smoke, and that's what we use primarily at Trappers is Nooski bacon. Nooski. Okay, wait a minute. I'm I'm I'm, I'm sending this. N e w s k y. No. N e u k. No. N e u s k e. I think. N e u s k e. See if and that comes called, up. It's called Nooski fat. Well, I use the bacon and then I render it and get the fat from that. Oh, Nooski bacon. Right, yeah. Mm. And so they have a they have a store in Wisconsin that has 
smoked everything. Like you can get smoked goose, smoked duck, smoke a bunch of different things. And it really has, Nooski has, like, if someone put five bacons out, I could pick the Nooski out of the five bacons. It's just got a u- little more unique flavor. Five pounds of Nooski Applewood smoked bacon is 60 bucks, $12 a pound. Is it worth it? Um, I pay quite a bit less because I buy it wholesale. Yes, I, I, I think it's worth it. You don't have to get it every day. Also, the one that's really good is the peppered bacon that they have. And so that's really cool on sandwiches. Like, obviously, I can use it every day, but it's 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 pretty spectacular. And okay. five pounds is not that much. Like, if you go to the store right now and get bacon, it's not inexpensive to buy bacon right now. Certainly not to 60 bucks, but I didn't do the math on that. But. Hold on one sec. I'm looking this up. Yeah, that's 12 bucks a pound. So normal bacon's like, I don't know, seven. So we pay about eight fifty or nine bucks a pound. But we put it on everything. And that's why, you know, when you see our burger, it costs a little more than, not a whole lot more than other people when you add bacon. But it adds that extra layer of flavor. Don't and get me started on duck bacon. Do you market do you market new skis on your menu or do, is it just it's just what you prefer? It's a higher in bacon. Your customers no, it the says Nooski right in the menu. And so that on the burgers and on the duck BLT that we do, you get both duck bacon and uh, Nooski bacon. Don't get me started on duck bacon. That's what you were about. That's what you were saying before <laughs> I cut you off. It's your favorite? It is, it is pricey, but uh, it's different and it's cool. You know, what they really do is make bacon out of a duck breast. Yeah. And so they smoke it and then they slice it super thin. And then we grill it, and that's what we put on the sandwich. I do it all the time in a pastrami format with a brine and all that. Right, yeah. It's it's phenomenal. We, you know, it's like, uh, I want to say it's 25 bucks a pound for us. That speckle belly, which is my favorite eating waterfowl, they're like a rice-eating bird. Louisiana, East Texas, uh, Arkansas, and California are where they're very prevalent. They're right. a warm wet, They're a warm-weather bird, so they tend to migrate a faster than most of the other snow geese or Canada geese, um, but they're phenomenal table fare. They also say the same thing about the Sandhill Crane, but I love speckle belly goose, and I do pastrami with that chef, and it is freaking unbelievable. So I I, I, I'm right there with you. So back to our – right before we got off on that, the butter's in there. Add a little oil. Keep the heat down to, so you don't burn the butter and smoke it out too bad. You don't want to get that bad taste into that fish because fish is pretty volatile – when it comes to accepting flavors, that's when you said bacon, bacon fat, that almost seems like it would overpower. Does, does it do, does it, does it make no. a good flavor for fish? Yeah. But because you're using the rub, now you got a bunch of flavors going on and no, yeah. you know, if you're doing white fish or something, there's no flavor on that fish. Anyway, you're really not tasting fish. Right. You know what I'm saying? Once you got the rub on, so more it's about, you're going to have those different layers of both the rub and, a, and a bacon on there. Um, it's not going to be very fishy just because it's going to, there's, even if you rub, like um, the only one it's going to really show is like, if you did a salmon or something like that, that's got more pronounced flavor that you're really going to notice the fish on, on from the rub. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like you, you have a lot of fish that you eat and you taste if you put the rub on it. I do. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no, no. I'm talking like you, I, 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 I don't, I don't know if I've had one bite of fishiness with the with the way I've been doing yeah, fish over the last five years. I don't think you years. would. Yeah, because once you put the rub on it, you're going to get rid of that fish, and you probably you probably you skin most years or not. Yeah, yeah. Now I when when I got this fish last week, the first thing I said to the the husband and wife that gave me this walleye was. I've been. I told. I was bragging on you. I said I've been working with the chef up in, in Minnesota, and he does his fried walleye with the skin on. And they're like, "We've never done that." And I'm like, "Well, y'all are born and she's from Michigan. He's from Minnesota, but he's never done it that way." Yeah. Once you descale it, it's you know the skin is pretty light on that fish. It's not like salmon or or lake trout that's thick. You know, it's pretty thin skin. So once you scale it, it's you know very light, but it's nice and crispy and stuff when you get in the deep fryer. I, I love the walleye with the skin on. 
All right, so now educate our audience and myself. When you said a pan fry or a saute, is there a difference? And if so, what, 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 if I guess, first of all, what would be a definition of saute? Saute technically means to make jump. That's technically what it means. Make so jump. when you saute something, it's like you're putting it in there. You know, you got a super hot pan. You put it in there for a few seconds, and then you're flipping the pan and doing a few more seconds on the other side. You know what I mean? That's really what saute means. So a hot pan, and you're cooking it really fast so that you're searing the outside, but keeping the inside juicy. That's technically what you're doing when you're sauteing. So is would a wok style, Asian style cooking be sauteing when you're flipping yep. the vegetables and the peppers and everything? Definitely. That is a saute. That's a saute. Yeah, just made with a wok. Let's stay right there for a second. I'm a I'm addicted to Asian food. Yeah, our, I love our, okay, you love Asian food. So the last two days I found this place in California, in the state capital of Sacramento. I was down there for a sporting event. And they and they do they were doing pho and this pho was tendon, tripe, flank steak and brisket in a beef broth. I cannot master the broth part of pho. I don't like you could make a soup, right? You could I could right. go and make a chicken noodle soup or a minestrone, and I, and I'm happy with it. I'm not right. saying I'm the best soup maker. I, I know that there soups can be you know I like a good broth in it and and, and getting creative with the onions and all that. But what in the heck do I have to do? Do you have any insight on a pho broth? I believe we had this discussion. A little, yeah, we did a little bit. The, remember, did you reduce the stock? Yeah, I start. I, I I have done it with reducing duck and chicken stock. I haven't. Can I do it with like? Would you use like a big prime rib bone in there, or a, some some porterhouse bones, or a ribeye bone on a no. beef stock? Not really, because what you're after, like if you're making beef, what you're after is what's inside the bone. You're after, yes, the brown, like if you get a big beef bone, you got like a little meat on the outside and you're brown in that, like you're making a brown, you're browning it really well in the oven. But in order to make the stock, you want that bone to be broken open because the marrow inside is both flavor and it's what gives it that gelatinous taste on your mouth. You know that taste like it's not just stock, but that extra level? That's, that's what why, after. That's why, and I want you to continue, but that's why when you have leftovers of pho, it's almost unedible if you, if, you, if you don't heat it back up the right way. When you open up pho leftovers, it's a lot different than opening up just a regular soup leftover if that makes sense right yeah and it's, because, get it of that, it's because of that gelatin texture you're talking about right and so that's same with chicken bone like you know when you're doing chicken that's the difference between cooking a raw chicken bones and cooked chicken like turkey after you've had the turkey and then you cook the bones if you bone the turkey first then cook the bones for soup that's two different stocks one is more gelatinous and got that you almost feel like your hair is getting glossy when you're having it because of the richness of that stock. Unlike once you, once you've roasted that turkey, then when you do it, then you've you know the, a lot of the goodness has already gone out of it. And so that's why you always start with raw. You're always starting with cold water because if you start with hot water, then you're poaching those bones. When you start with cold water, as it heats up it draws the stuff out of those bones. Huh. That okay, makes sense? so, yeah, 100%. Like if, think about if you're boiling something, you're going to have hot water, and you're going to put it in, it's going to start cooking from the outside. Well, if you want to get the stuff out of the inside, then you're starting with cold water, and as it heats up, it's drawing the stuff out of it. The heat well, up. When you say heats up, how? what's the pace that you want the heat to come into the, the water and the broth? As long as you start with cold water, it doesn't matter. Like you it do starts cold coming water, out right you away. bring it right to a boil. But you're getting stuff out of it as you start with cold water. It starts to draw stuff out of those bones. That's where you're getting it. You're getting the flavor instead of, oh, I got something super hot, and I'm going to drop my bones into that water. You're just cooking bones. You're not getting what you want. So if pho and... There, there seems to be an explosion of 
Asian food fondness in this country right now. Sushi, fuzz, the ramens. There's a lot of restaurants popping up in a lot of different parts of the country. I almost, in every place, and I travel a lot, every place I go, if I go to Nashville, I got to go to Miss Saigon's. If I go, if I'm around here, I got to go to the Noodle Cafe. Like, I, I have all of these different places I love to go. Is it fair to say that in all of these kitchens of pho restaurants that this this process is being taken place, or is there a way to cut corners on it? Do some of them, you assume, cut corners and buy the broth already, or are they boiling yeah. it down and doing this process? Um, well, it really depends on how good the restaurant is. Like, even I use a lot of things that I can get now that I used to not be able to get, like Glace de Vion, which is a veal stock, so you start with five quarts of or five gallons of veal stock and you boil it down till it's about a quart or a quart and a half. So it's super thick and gelatinous. So I can buy that now where it used to be as a chef, you had to make it. So would you be able to make good tasting pho broth with what you can buy yourself? Do you have confidence in that Asian flair? I, I am not a huge Asian cook myself. So I would say, no, I would have to take a couple runs at it. You know what I mean? It's an experimented thing. Normally, if I'm going to start with something like that, I probably would start raw and make it and then figure out what there is out there to get. Because there are different levels of base, but they can only go so far. So a lot of times you might make a chicken stock and it's okay, but instead of adding salt, you may add a tiny bit of base to it. You know what I mean? To fortify it not necessarily do it but there are the problem the difference with asian stuff is there's so many different spices that not that is usually not used in french cooking you know what i mean yeah. or american cooking you know they have a lot a lot of different chili peppers and stuff like that and, and different or not so much chili peppers but different spices and herbs that they use in order to get that's why i think it pops up so much is it's different flavors it's cooked fast. It's got, you know, a lot of it's more nutritious for you. So I think that's part of the drive of, of what it is. It's, you know, it's different. They put one on Walker. I wish they would. You know, we're always looking for something Asian food here. So I got to drive all the way down to Brainerd to get it. Um, when you talk about the simplicity of it, and there's only so far they can take it. It really is simple. Like the colors there. And then it's a lot of scallions or green onion and white onion a lot there's a lot of onion right. in in a, in a good pho broth is onion really prevalent in asian cooking for the most part i think that it is i want to say oh, that yeah. whether it's tapenaki or um like an itchy bond you know what's that what's that hibachi i guess grill a, yeah. a, 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 onions very prevalent in asian cooking yep green onion and white um uh a very a lot more green onion usually I think I see than I see white because yeah. it's you know the green onion has a little different flavor it's a little fresher tasting because it's got you know I use some of the green and the white when I'm doing it so it's got that fresh you're cutting it fresh where diced onion you might be buying the diced onion unless you're dicing it yourself onion. you know what I mean like we go through you know five ten pounds of onions a week but they're we buy them pre diced so they're not as fresh as getting them right there and dicing. But I think the green onion is very Asian forward. And they'd use a lot of, you know, fresh ginger. Um, uh, all their vegetables are fresh. Um, all that kind of stuff. They, and when they get their meat, a lot of their stuff, they, they buy in blocks frozen. And then slice it on a slicer super thin. And that's where they get, like, gets a lot of flavor out of it because it gets out of there fast. You know, uh, like, if you look at their stir fry stuff, their stuff's pretty thin cut. Yeah, because because the high heat, it's just going to the heat's going to be on. It. It's going to be thoroughly cooked enough to to get what they want out of it and still have that crispiness and that flavor. Yeah, they they don't I don't know what it. I don't know why I'm so addicted to it. Like, I think a lot of it's healthy if you don't gorge yourself on a lot of the rice noodle or the white rice and the sushi. If you're eating more sashimi than nigiri and you're not having a lot of the what they call the the sticky rice, you know, that's got a real right. high sugar content to it. Yeah. But 
And if you look at Asian people for the whole, they're smaller people and they don't, it's not like they're not eating. Those dudes, when they go to eat, there's, they hammer, they hammer yep. meals. I mean, when, when it's time to eat, it's time to eat. There's not a whole bunch of socialization like there is in Italy around an Asian table. I mean, they're just hammering food. Um, right. And I'm not saying they're not social people, so don't take it that way. I'm just saying that they, they eat. So the, the food is simple, but man, is it freaking good the way that they get their flavor profiles around it yeah and it's fresh i mean you hardly ever see frozen broccoli when you get beef and broccoli they use fresh broccoli they don't buy frozen broccoli and toss it in there you know what i'm saying yeah i mean and all their vegetables are fresh and crispy and, and that's part of of their thing so way better for you you're not getting you know i don't see many of their meats that have fat on them you know what i mean like if you go and have uh yeah there is isn't fried rice or something it's pretty lean pork it's not like i took a pork steak and cut it up and has a lot of fat on it yeah same with their fuzz like when you get that brisket which is a very fatty meat right uh, you know there you don't get a lot of that fat in there it would not be i don't think it'd be a good and a good experience because of the what you refer to as like that gelatin based broth and right. then adding a bunch of that fat in there i don't think is necessarily or needed or desired at all Right. I'm sure they cook it with the fat on it and then trim the fat off and get get the good meat out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And so it's, that's the other thing about oriental food. You know, it's it's lean. It's lean meats. You don't, you don't see them like us eating, you know, a fat Wagyu steak or even, uh, you know, when we cut brisket, we leave quite a bit of the fat on it. But that's because that's the way we eat. Like, you know, truly, you know, if we wanted to be healthy, I'd be trimming all the fat off the brisket. And then slicing it. But I wouldn't do that because, you know, I'm a fataholic. I, obviously. I No, I think, you know, obviously you say that you try to like get like the self-deprecation part of cooking. Um, one of the biggest self-deprecating jokes of a chef is, you know, you can't trust a skinny chef, right? Exactly. You, yep. you hear that all over the over the place because if he's not eating his own cooking, then then who the heck's going to eat it? And it's, it's so true um, that eating is – food is awesome and and doing it in the way of of like the way that you do in the in the dishes that you prep for us when i was there um which i'm going to touch on in a second here about maybe a little challenge to you is there's just there's really no way around it that th this whole fitness explosion and eating clean and eating organic and knowing where your food comes from i'm all about it i'm all about balance i hope that everybody could be balanced enough to work out and burn enough calories to enjoy the stuff that you cook and not have to worry about gaining 15 pounds. Cause when I, if I went to your place, your resort and stayed there for a week, I wouldn't say no to anything that you cook. So I have to freaking go work out to like balance <laughs> counteract it. Right. Like but that's my only choice. It, you know, the more, the more rich food that we get, the less we really have to give you like, you're not probably going to sit down and eat Ooh. a 16 ounce Wagyu steak. I'm not. You'd Two be lights, like, I'm good. Yeah, you'd be like, uh, I'm done. And so, you know, when we do rib uh, steak, a lot of times we do a four or six ounce Wagyu steak. It's rich and that's plenty. And we give you some vegetables and starch. But it's not like if we gave you a regular steak, you know, we'd have to give you a 12 or 16 ounce steak. So eat better food, but eat less of it. Like fish, a six ounce portion of let's say, or a king salmon, which is one of the highest fat content salmon you can get. It's like 26% or something is, is you only need six ounces of it because it's rich and it's great. When you, when you talk about the Wagyu before I go into my, my experience at your place, um, why, and I know that I've asked you this before, but I got to ask again because I'm still not sold on it. Right. Why the gravies and the sauces for red meats and steaks and Wagyu and fancy dishes that you make? Why do you like just a dry rub salt and pepper steak or do you have to have the gravies and the sauces? No, I don't have gravies. I prefer a compound butter myself. Compound butter. Or even, you know, a butter on top of that steak. Now, I'm talking about when I have a regular filet. I have to have a lot less butter if I'm having that Wagyu. But it adds that, just that extra buttery goodness on it. But when we do sauces right now and stuff on it, a lot of it is just a little. We don't do like 
we cover the we don't cover the whole thing in a state you know in a sauce or something so we've done like a balsamic glaze on the edge of a steak or a little demi but just some to to transfer the mushrooms on like we may make a mushroom demi just to put on the edge of it but we rarely now coat the whole thing in sauce unless it's like uh turn those oscar where it calls for hollandaise over the whole thing now, what I, about what about fruity sauces that that would go on like a like a berry glaze on? Is there a place in your heart for this with beef? Oh Some yeah, Some kind of blueberry like or lingonberry. Ba- what one? Lingonberry. Lingonberry. That's pre- that's really prevalent up here. It's lingonberry jam. So we have a lingonberry demi that we do on ducks and stuff, but we've done it on beef. It's been pretty good. Also, uh, I think we talked about this last time. A gastrique, you know what I'm talking about? So gastrique is a vinegar fruit uh, sauce that is super light. So I cheat uh, with it a little bit. There's there's a way to make it, it takes a lot longer. I often just use balsamic glaze with a fruit puree together. So we get a lot of different fruit purees. So it could be a berry, could be caramelized pineapple, uh, a couple other ones that I would might use uh, blackberry or something like that on it. So it's got a little different profile with that little sweet sour sauce on it. It gives a little different profile than just having, you know, uh, a brown sauce or a demi or something like that. Okay, so I want to get into I want to I, I want to get into more of the the Asian culture with you in this way. And I'm just wondering if this can happen. Um, I am going to, I, it looks like I'm coming back this summer for the event I would with think enough, so. with enough prep. What'd you say? I said, I would hope so for enough. I thought you said, I hope not. I hope not. No, I, was like, oh, okay. I hope to see you again, right, coach. Um, <laughs> if I send a challenge out there and I know that it's, could you potentially have a genuine Mark Chef Mark Lindsay Vietnamese pho on the menu for a special one of the nights I was there with enough warning so I could evaluate this and give you my critique? Or could we do it privately to where maybe the, the, it's not offered on the menu? Right. Uh... I with maybe, look at, with, with, let me with do maybe, some research. With, with maybe some very, like, like I love, one of my favorite fuzz is tendon, beef tendon, which is, you know, like in the wrists or the ankles and stuff of a cow or a steer. And then the, the what they call rare steak, which it comes rare and then it cooks within the, the heat of the pho once you put it into the hot broth. You could do that with duck and get it at the perfect temp. We could do strips of mallard or whatever duck you have up there, um, you know, in your freezer. Or I could help get that done or farm duck, for, you know, to serve it to the restaurant. It would have to be farm raised, but like thin strips of and I got a guy, a buddy in, in San Francisco Bay that his girlfriend's a chef. And she actually told me that she does sea duck pho with strips of rare uh rare duck across the top and then they just let the pho broth eat it could we pull that off i'm saying yes <laughs> i like it when is it you guys come you guys come I in think it's, i think it's i'm assuming it's in august again but i haven't got the exact right. dates but i i just heard from uh our, our partner benelli last week that it's a go so i just got to get the uh i'll see if i can get oh, it yeah, before this conversation the, you guys come for the fall classic yeah, well, the the big sale at Reeds is in August, right? Is that called yeah, the Fall Classic? Yeah, that's the Fall Classic. Yep. Okay, I'm going to put that on my... You know who's good at oriental cooking, so I'm going to let you know. You remember my sous chef, Ashley? Yeah, oh, yeah. She's probably going to work into being the chef sometime in the near future, and I might just go back to my real role of food and beverage director. Really? Still, yeah. Well, that would... When I came, I had been a food and beverage director for almost 20 years. My, my deal is both the money, training chefs, and running the large resort. That's normally my background. I was a chef for 20 years before that. So for 20 years, like I went to chef school. For 20 years, I was a chef. And then I went to the call the dark side of the front of the house. Um, and so as a food and beverage, like I was at Lutheran Resort for almost uh, 12 years as a food and beverage director. So I've done a lot of training chefs 
to be in to be that role. And so, you know, I'm getting older. It's a lot harder for me to pull that chef gig off being uh, 62 than uh, it is for me to be the food and beverage director. But we're working with Ashley and the chef. She is really strong in Asian cuisine. So Ashley and I are going to get together and put something together for you. How about that? I'm, I'm, I'm writing a note on it right now. Yes. Oh, you're going to memo to yourself. No, I'm working. I'm, I, I told you I would get the dates. It's August 11th through the 13th. Okay. So it would probably be that Friday or Saturday night. I won't. I think that's a. I think that's a Friday or Saturday. Yeah. Um. Is it? Did you look? Yeah, August yeah. 11th is a Friday. So Friday, oh, August 11th, and Saturday, August 12th would be the time I plan on being there. Now I have some idea what, like last time you guys caught me off guard. I didn't know you guys, like, I didn't know you guys would want to eat that kind of stuff because no one ever gave me any warning. But now no, I, I, know I, did, I didn't know, I didn't know you. Now I know you. Right. Now I know. Well, now I have time to prep for you guys. Like think about really more of uh, some cool stuff that we can do for you way guys are there. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that, that, that yeah. would be really cool. It would be so cool if I could bring a film crew and film you doing the fun. But maybe that's the next time after you master it. But I got some ideas for a new TV thing I'm working on right now. So I will get you uh, details and, 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 and have a return visit. It for sounds that like you need a full-time chef. Come on. I don't know what you're thinking. I know. Well, that's, <laughs> I want to be – I did a lunch today to where I looked at my assistant and I went, I, I want to be a chef. I have so much – I have so much admiration and respect for good chefs of people that that literally know how to do everything from the vision to the prep to the flavors, the heat, the right temps, the right texture, the right crispiness, and then all the way to the plating and the experience of it once it's in front of the end user. There's so much that goes into it, and I hope someday that I don't have ADD bad enough to where I can actually – take time to enjoy the eating part of it. Cause it seems like I eat so fast cause I'm on to the next thing, you know, but that's right. a big part of it. That experience and that taste, like tasting whiskey or wine or, or beer and pairing those with food. I want to get better at better at all of that. I think the eating experience is, it's just so fun, but the chef part of it, it's almost, it's, it's, it's as cool of me as being a pilot. I like, I, I don't think I could ever become a pilot because I don't trust myself. But when I see aviation pilots that fly these big jets commercially or fighter jet pilots or whatever, even guys in little Cessnas, I'm like, man, that's really cool. That's really cool yeah. to become a pilot. But a chef is like, again, we refer to the show, The Chef, the movie with John Favreau and Dustin Hoffman. And the critique comes into the French restaurant and John Favreau puts his best foot forward and the chef just at, or the critic just absolutely tears him apart and destroys right. who he is to the point to where that's it. He loses it. And he tells the guy what he thinks. He gets fired from Dustin Hoffman. He goes off and finds himself again with a food truck and falls in love with food again. And then that critic comes back begging to be able to taste his food in the end. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know if there's a cooler thing to do to be able to express yourself. Art's awesome. Music is unbelievable. You right. hear a song and you're like, oh, that was really cool. I want to hear it again. You taste the right food. You're just like, oh my God, it can change your life. You're like, oh wow, that just changed my yeah. life. And I made this lunch today, this brunch, and I was really proud of it, of how I did. It was a customized bacon out of Arkansas. It was farm fresh eggs. It was avocado. It was fresh tomatoes. It was onion. It was garlic. It was olive oil. Um, and it, it, it was presented right. I plated it in a different way. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Like that's, that's what chefs get to do every okay. night of their job. You know, all this stuff you tell me, I, I, I can't, it's hard for me to think of you not as a chef. You just have a lot of different knowledge of a lot of different things because you see a lot of different stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's really what it is. It's, for me, sometimes if I look at something, already, this wheel's are already starting to go to my head. Like when the fish guy sends me what he has in stock, I'm always going, hey, what the heck? Oh, cool. You have this. Or, hey, I've never tried that. Let's get it in and start playing with it. I mean, that's my mindset of now of, oh, I want to try that. Or I, I can think of 10 different things I want to do with that. And that just comes naturally all the time. You start thinking about, oh, that's how it is. And a lot of it's ingrained just from chef school. Because they taught you all the basics, and now you're getting to use those in that, just like how to make stock. That was one of the first classes we had is how to make stock. 
but all those things you use all the time. And you, at the time you're like, oh, that does, that's crazy. But now when you think about doing it, you're like, that makes total sense. You know what I mean? But it's, it's, you have great exposure. A lot of times what we have trouble with in the area is uh, competition. There's not a ton of competition, especially for what I do. So I always have to watch like cooking shows or go other cities or something to get, see what else everybody's doing. Because up here, I don't get to see, I only see people who are doing stuff that is less than what we're doing. And that's hard to train a chef when they don't get to see that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, even younger chefs. Wait, so I want to put that in a, a synopsis. So you're saying somebody like, okay, from like if the way that I just explained how I look at chefs and the culinary art, you think that my mind would be broadened enough to be more coachable and teachable to get the, the precise needs down of how to do a broth, how, because, because I kind of seen it. So I kind of have a better idea than somebody just going into it raw. Yeah. Because you, you know where you want to get to. And so it is, it is easier than you think once you understand the basics. How do you make a good stock? You know, how do you, uh, how do you put your meat, stuff like that? And you probably do a lot of that already, but you're in, like, you know, as much foul and stuff you, and, and game and stuff you guys do, you put your, a lot of it yourself, right? The All reason, the reason everybody calls me to help butcher is because when I went to chef school, that's one of the classes you learn, Hey, this is where you cut to get these primal cuts. So my buddy, every time he gets a beer, Hey, come and come and help me cut this deer up. Cause I know how to cut it into steaks. I know how to get rid you know, I know what stuff to make in the burger and I know what to add to the burger to get to it. But all that was from classes that I took at chess school to learn the basics. You know, how do you cut vegetables? How do you, you know, different herbs and spices, all those kind of things we learn. And now it's, you know, practical time. I think if you saw a few of those things, you could say, okay, now I know what he's talking about. I can do this. I, I just took a note down right there about um, a guy named Mike Parker that I get to, to cook with in California every year. And he is the exact person that you just described. And I've learned a lot from him because um, the vision at the beginning of the process of, of not knowing the recipe, like, I guess like getting a cookbook and reading the recipe, you know, line by line is one way of cooking and thank God for cookbooks and people that buy them. But to, to be a visionary and be like, I want to get to here and I have this. I, I, I refer to it a lot of like my dad was and Mike is, is that Mike can go shopping and buy exactly what he needs because he's envisioning this recipe. My dad could open the refrigerator and see 48 hour leftovers, 48 hours at the oldest and come up with a MacGyver recipe like that, whether it was a goulash or a mixture that's of me. something. That's you. And that's that's what I take a lot of pride in at Honey Camp because I grew up poor. My mom and dad worked their butts off. And, and, and But those times were different back in the 80s. And I, I was taught not to waste food. So I saw some leftover asparagus the other day, and I'm like, I'm not throwing that away. I can do something with that. So that that MacGyver mentality, and for anybody that doesn't understand that reference, MacGyver was a TV show to where he would see a shoelace and a duck decoy, and he would make a parachute out of it and jump out of an airplane, for lack of better um, you know, detail. But MacGyver could come up with something in a heartbeat, and that's what Chef Lindsay refers to himself as. Why is that? Well, when you guys came and you said, hey, what do you got? I went up to the freezer or the refrigerator and said, okay, I got six of these, four of that, eight of that. Let's put that meal together. That's what I, and normally when you're a chef and you're doing specials, if you're not planning them out, a lot of times you're going to the walk-in and saying, hey, I got specials. What am I, what am I going to make it out of? Or what do I want for special? Hey, look, I've got these four products. Let me get them in and we'll create stuff. A lot of times when we bought stuff for the resort, I would bring something in and then Ashley and I would play with it of, hey, I think we're going to do this. Let's try it. Uh, if we didn't like that, let's try it a little different way. And that's kind of what we do. Like when I order something in, I don't say I'm ordering this because I'm going to do this special recipe I saw. And normally when I buy a recipe book, it's for the picture, not the recipe, by the way. Um, but yeah. normally I'm looking at the item and saying, wow, I want to try that elk chop and I'm going to bring it in and do this to it. 
whether it's good or bad. I want to, you know what I mean? And so this time I'm going to do something different with it. Or um, I know duck confit, let's do this. And then let's do something else with the breast that's going to go on top of it. So a lot of that's, we may buy the item, but I necessarily don't say that's the exact special until I think about it for a minute. Oh, I've got, I want to get this. What am I going to do with it? Or what's, or more so the guy, the fish guy sends me, hey, this is in season right now, or this price just went down. If you guys want some, you know, let me know. Like right now, soft shell crabs are in season. So we're getting ready to order those. We'll have those for like Memorial Day. Oh, those are good too. If they're done right. They got to right. be we, done right. We sold out every time uh, when we do them. And it's very, uh, very light batter that we make uh, and then uh, bread them and then deep fry them. And then we have, uh, um, that's one we have put in uh, like a lingonberry aioli on top of. So just lingon the lingonberries we were talking about earlier in mayonnaise on top. That is great for fish or seafood. You should try that. Well, I need the recipe. Do you, I, can I get, do what? You should, be, you should be able to get lingonberries at your, where do you live? What state? California. Nevada. 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 I'm betting you can get lingonberries. I don't know. I've, uh, it's. It's a Minnesota thing. I know that that we get a lot of, because we have Norwegian influence. But you should be able to get them. And really, it's just take the lingonberry jam and stir it into the mayonnaise until you get the right color. When you taste it, you'll be able to taste the berry and the mayonnaise at the same time. So it's I like it better a, than tartar sauce. Do you have a preference preference on mayonnaise? Uh, I buy the real stuff. Like normally I buy Hel Hellman's or something. Uh, I'm all about paying more for it to get the best one. Have you because... ever had uh, Duke's? No. It's a Southern thing, I believe. Okay. Good mayonnaise and lingonberries. L-I-G-E-N. L-I-N-G-E-N-B-E-R-R-Y, -E -E I think. Yeah, lingonberries. Okay. I'll have, I'm going to look into that. Um they're really, it's really good for fish. They're good if you put them in a brown sauce for a wild game, uh, uh, fowl. There's just a lot of things. Like when I first moved up there, I thought, wow, these are really cool. We, I just start making all sorts of stuff out of it. So we have it in our Jack Daniels barbecue sauce, lingonberries. Really? I'm going to try yeah. that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, if I can't find them, then I'm going to have to uh... – Ask you to send me some, or when I come up, I can bring some back. When are they? When are they in season? They're not in season. They're all. The, well, I can get them anytime. Okay, they're all. They're in any jam. Time. Yeah, don't get fresh. It's, it's going to come like a lingonberry jam or in a jar. Or oh, something like that. oh, oh, oh. Okay, so don't get fresh. Fresh are are, are really tart. Okay, lingonberry jam. We should be able to find that online, no problem. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Um. Uh. And. If you ever want fresh, Prairie Harvest has fresh frozen that are pretty good. Have you heard me talk about Prairie Harvest, right? Prairie, Prairie Harvest, Harvest is my wild game store or wild game online. That's where I buy all my wild game from. And they have the berry jam? Um, no, they have just straight lingonberries. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm sure if you just Amazon them. You, you'll be able to get lingonberries out of it. If not, let me know, and I'll send you some, because we get them all the time. Okay, I just put that on there. All right, so we have a challenge. We have some dialogue going. Um, when I come up there, I want to learn, maybe spend some more time actually in the kitchen and learning from you and your sous chef. What was her name again? I'm sorry. Ashley. Ashley. I'll, yep. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap with you and Ashley and hang out. I'm excited to get back up there. I'll keep you filled in on details. Um, and then... If we could put together a pho and then you master it and then you're like, here's what I did. And then I can take it back and master it out here. I would love to learn how to do it. It's really, it's, 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 it's tricky in my opinion to get the right, to get it right. Right. Um, so you mentioned before matching uh, wine and bourbons and stuff like that is something, is that something you're into or not? Yeah. I'd love to bring some Jack Daniels up there and do it. You brought some last time. I, yeah. I would come up with some, other things that we might try we're, we're putting some flights together um i i have a a growing wine list when i was at lutz and i had over 200 wines on my wine list wow so i have pretty strong wine knowledge and a bourbon knowledge and uh 
getting some good tequilas right now. Scotch, I'm I'm not a big scotch drinker, although I know quite a bit about scotch. Well, just but remember I'm, I'm more uh, of a bourbon guy. Just remember that I am very loyal to Jack Daniels. And they got some stuff that we could get creative with with their new bonded, their new triple right. match, their new ten, their new twelve. There's there's some new ones out there that uh, I could help get up there. We could the, do some pairings with them. The single barrel select. Yeah, that's what I brought you last really year. Like. Now, uh, I have not seen. I used to be able to get Sinatra. I have not seen it anywhere. It's it's back. They 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 could not get a lot made during COVID because of the the actual barrels that were needed for it because they were so busy with production of their of the of obviously number seven. But right. they're starting to make Sinatra again, and it's available again now. Yeah, I am really about the higher proof because of the flavor that I get. So yeah. if you put like 120 proof in ice, then you're down to 90 or 95, but you get way more flavor. Because yep. the only difference between 120 proof and 80 proof is how much water they added yep. at the distillery. Yep. You know, if they, I want water uh, down, I'll use ice. Yeah, you need to try. I'll get you the, the new bonded is 100 out of the, the bottle. So is the triple mash. But they got the new Koi Heel, which is anywhere from 141 to 147 proof. And it is awesome sipping whiskey. It's called Single Barrel Special Reserve Koi Hill. Wow, and that's it, very it's tasty. Phenomenal. I'll get some up there for our little uh, our little rendezvous in August, and we'll do some pairings with Jack Daniels. Sweetness. I'm making a note of that right now. All right, I'm all about I'm all about some bourbon and whiskey. All right, to end this, tell me what you're going. Anything new on the menu starting in, in a couple of weeks for the beginning of fishing that I that that's going to be awesome for your uh, for your consumers um, and, and, and guests and patrons when they're in the restaurant. There is. Let me bring the menu up. Because I every time I, I was thinking about we we're going to have this conversation earlier, and I was like, okay, now what was it we put back on the menu? Um, let me bring it back up. Um, uh, I just had it. Um, I know we have uh, – oh, now I can't find it. Oh, wait. Oh, here. We're, yeah, we're doing like a grilled Caesar salad. I know we're doing that. Chicken we're doing, uh, or fish too? Chicken? Um, you can add chicken, but it, you just take the crispy romaine the crispy and just cut it on the grill for a minute. We have a new broiler. I don't know if we had it when, we were, when you were there. So a, a little broiler that we used just – more for charring and stuff like that. Have you ever had charred grapes? No, sounds awesome. Put that on your list of, you're going to have some. They are phenomenal. So just red grapes, just soak them in a little wine for a little bit. You don't have to soak them. And then throw them on a char till they start to brown a little bit. Oh my God, they are so good. Um, that's on not charcoal, on the you said? Huh? Charcoal? No, just char it. Just char, char the grill. Yep. So just on any time next time you're out barbecuing or you're grilling out of your house, just take some grapes and put them on the grill for a little bit. They'll start to chaw a little bit. Oh, my God, the flavor that they bring out in them, it's phenomenal. Okay, I just took that note. Um, let's see what else. You know, we're putting walleye sandwich on it, nothing huge. Um, a caprese pasta we're doing. This uh, creamy uh, pesto sauce with tricolored tomatoes, mozzarella balls, chicken topped with balsamic glaze. The pasta, pretty good. So we that's kind of taken after a caprese, a caprese salad with the exactly right. Um, we're turning our uh, pork belly into sliders, so we're adding that to the menu. Um, we added uh, pizza with caramelized onions and goat cheese. Ooh, which was pretty good too. But a lot of the other stuff, some of the the usuals we're leaving on there because we get so many quests for it. If I took them off, I'd be killed. Like, you know, duck BLT is huge and and uh, um, ribs are going really well. Our Wagyu steak, we have it on there all the time. Our uh, Wagyu made from the Zabaton. So this is the Merit yep. Bar and Grill on Leech Lake. Yep, at Trapper's Landing. At Trapper's Landing which is a part of the Reed's family of brands. Unbelievable place to visit. Get up there and visit Mark Lindsay and Ashley. Eat this food. 
pair some whiskeys, pair some wines. He's got knowledge on all of it. Next time we're going to have Mark back, we're going to talk about what is a Michelin star? Does he have aspirations of ever reaching these plateaus in the cooking world? Don't answer yet, chef. We okay. will talk about this next time because when I hear a Michelin star, I think of tires and 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 how you rate your tires. But this has something to do with high-end culinary destinations across the world. And I want to talk to Mark about one of the ones that I ate in New York in October during duck season. I had the privilege of eating at Salt Bay's uh, Nuzeret Steakhouse in in New York City. And I have some reviews on that. And uh, we'll talk about that next time. Any closing words, my man, Mr. Chef Mark Lindsay? No, it was really good to see you, though. I haven't seen you for a while, so it was great to talk to you. Um, I hope you had a great hunting season, the fall hunting season. Uh, it's great to see you. I can't wait to try our duck pho trapper's landing. The merit chef Mark Lindsay will have him on again sooner than later. I'm off the road for a while, so you'll be seeing him more consistently talking about recipes. Let's uh, let's come up with a couple recipes that you do during the grand opening. We'll come back on and 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 uh, you can talk about how good the not the grand opening, but the 2023 season opening was, and uh, what the atmosphere is like like around there. And we'll uh, we'll. Uh, just uh, stay in touch and, and keep the recipes and all this cooking knowledge coming to our listening audience. Thank you, Chef. Won't last too long, so what you gonna do? The money's all gone. I'd rather be poor living off in a hole than rich as hell without a soul.